Dear members, uh, dear partners, thank you to be with us today for this interesting topic of the day about uh, the situation with the uh, sanctions, with the future sanctions, with the past sanctions, with the actual sanctions, and uh, with all what is related to. Uh, I would like to say a big, big thanks uh, to our long-standing member, uh, Dentons of the law firm. I would like to especially thank uh, Nadia Nichai uh, from the Dentons office in Brussels for the supporting, for the help to organize this event. Of course, I would like to thank our, uh, our speakers uh, from uh, Washington. Uh, Mr. Jason Silverman and uh, Peter Feldman, uh, both partner of, uh, partners of the Dentons uh, in the United States. Thank you to be with us this morning. And I would like to also thank, of course, uh, Konstantin Kroll from the Moscow office. Uh, thank you to joining us so late. Uh, in the same time. Thank you. I will uh, then um, start with the uh, with the welcome word from uh, our Belgian ambassador, His Excellency Mark Michelsen. Unfortunately, he can not be with us because of the travel to Lipetsk. He will visit. He was visiting uh, today uh, our member company Bekacht factory in Lipetsk and uh, also the Russian uh, NLMK, which. Uh, uh, has, uh, I think, two uh, or three plants uh, in uh, Belgium. Uh, dear members of the chamber, um, uh, I would say welcome to the seminar. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be with you as uh, uh, today I'm in the, uh, the city of Lipetsk uh, for uh, meeting with the local authorities um, and uh, one Belgian company and one Russian company that has business with Belgium, uh, Bekert and uh, NLMK. I know that uh, you are having a seminar today about uh, sanctions. Um, well, sanctions is a highly political matter. As you know, uh, the last uh, six weeks to two months uh, have been uh, very bumpy ones. Um, Two days ago, uh, the German Chancellor uh, Scholz was uh, in town in Moscow and uh, we heard some uh, positive news. So we can only hope that uh, the, the, the way of diplomacy will be chosen and that wisdom will prevail. Um, but notwithstanding that, uh, sanctions exist and, and so I think that the seminar you will attend uh, is going to be useful one for you. Thank you very much. Hola. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Unfortunately, not with us today. And uh, I will not then uh, spend uh, your time, dear colleagues, dear partners, dear member. Uh, I will let the floor uh, to Jason first. I will just let to share the screen. Thank you. Please, Jason. OK. Let's uh, hope this works. Hope everyone can see that. Um, yes, perfectly. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Silverman. I'm here with um, my uh, partner from the US, uh, uh, Peter Feldman. Um, we're both in our Washington DC office and we, uh, uh, we advise clients all over the world in uh, compliance with US sanctions and export controls. Uh, in, in other matters, but for purposes of today's uh, conversation, that's the relevant part of our practice. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you here today at this sort of inflection point or a very sort of critical time uh, in terms of sanctions and um, the relations between US and Russia. Uh, and what we hope to do um, is to give you uh, uh, first an overview of Russia and Russia-related sanctions authorities and their uses. Now, I expect that most of you are probably familiar with these, so we're not gonna spend a huge amount of time talking about them, but we wanna be as inclusive as possible, understanding that everyone may have varying degrees of familiarity or comfort with these topics. Um, and in addition, when we get to the point of what you need to know in terms of what might be coming, um, in the event of uh, certain developments involving Ukraine, 
uh, these will be um, important concepts to make sure that uh, that they're you know that, that for foundational purposes. Um, we'll talk about how things have changed in the last year with Russia sanctions under the Biden administration. Um, you know, again, I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time on that, but it can be helpful to understand how the current administration's approach with respect to sanctions differs from the last administration's approach. And finally, we will talk about where sanctions might be headed uh, based on the information um, that uh, we, we have access to uh, in the event of escalations uh, involving Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're happy to um, have questions along the way if people are interested in, in, in doing that. We'll try to manage that as best we can can given the platform, but certainly at the end, we've reserved some time for questions. So um, if we don't get to you while we're presenting, uh, we will uh, we will hopefully get to you uh, at the end of our presentation. Um, with that, I, uh, um, I, I, I swear I'm not completely done, uh, but I will turn it over to my colleague Peter right now to talk about um, the, uh, to, to sort of lay a groundwork in terms of the U.S. sanctions involving Russia. All right. Well, thanks, Jason. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Feldman, and I'm coming to you live from uh, Washington, D.C. And as Jason was kind enough to mention, uh, we've got the great uh, privilege of helping clients deal with sanctions and export controls uh, as they do business all around the world. And even though we're compliance lawyers this morning, this evening, we're living on the edge. And we're living on the edge because we made a PowerPoint about the US sanctions on Russia um, uh, more than uh, two minutes ago. And the reason why that's living on the edge is I think as we all know, uh, by the time we wrap up this morning, if you're still awake by the time I'm done, it's very possible, maybe even probable, that some of my slides will be nice historical relics of a time that was, uh, as opposed to a snapshot of the time that is and God knows about the time that will be. So with that caveat, uh, I want to talk a little bit about sort of why we're in the position we're in and what to make of it. And I want to start with probably, you know, the most foundational piece, which is what are the growing list of U.S. policy concerns, uh, objectives, uh, challenges, call it what you will. Uh, but what are the what are some of the key policy tent poles holding up the tent that is U.S. sanctions and export controls with respect to Russia? I'm not going to read the screen to you, but I do want to focus on a couple of points here. The first is that uh, there is no one single issue as between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, on which all of the sanctions and export controls are predicated. Uh, there's no single on-off button. There's no single thing where we can say, if X, then Y, or if not X, then not Y. Instead, it's a multitude of issues. And the reason why that multitude of issues is important is not just because it is a reflection of the complexity of the legal world and compliance world in which uh, uh, all of you uh, are, are living and, and navigating in real time. It's also a reflection of the panoply of legal authorities that the U.S. has and that the U.S. has used or might soon use in order to implement sanctions. Uh, it's also a reflection, uh, frankly, just of the complexity of what these sanctions look like in real life, where you have uh, multiple, sometimes overlapping, sometimes not entirely consistent or frankly satisfying guidance from the U.S. on where sanction X stops and where sanction Y starts. Um, when we look also at sort of the list of reasons that uh, animate U.S. sanctions policy, the last takeaway I'd flag for you is, in a sense, it's not just about Russia. Um, what's interesting is when you look at the bases for sanctions and export controls with respect to Russia, you've got North Korea in the mix, you've got Syria in the mix, you've got Venezuela in the mix. And uh, depending on how you wanna look at it, when you think about NS2, you've got Germany in the mix, you've got Ukraine in the mix, you've got the Baltics in the mix. So 
there are uh, any number of ways to sort of cut it. But as we think about what are the policy bases, the key takeaway is there's more than one. They're not necessarily linear in the sense that uh, policy reason X gives you sanctions Y. Uh, and what it means is as we sort of build on the, uh, build on the discussion today, uh, bear in mind that when we talk about all these different sort of bits and bobs of US sanctions and export controls, uh, each sort of has its own place in the ecosystem. Next slide, please, Jason. So I will spare everybody the history, which I'm sure that everyone on the line knows all that well. But the story here really starts, for today's purposes, uh, back in 2014. And really, the key takeaway from this slide is the sort of incremental point, uh, is the cumulative point, is the snowball rolling down the hill and picking up more snow point, uh, which is to say that, uh, you know, in a sense, when 2014 happened, I think the reaction that many people had was, okay, this is, this is something we need to pay attention to, and it's pretty significant. What we've seen, I think, over time is through that cumulative effect, what looked significant in 2014 became more significant. Uh, what looked like it was taking up a lot of time and attention and, and resources from a uh, corporate development, corporate compliance, corporate risk management perspective has only continued to take up more of those time uh, and, and resource allocations. When we think about sort of how things were built, we also have to think from a sectoral perspective. You know, we start in 2014 with Crimea and we build and we build and we layer on and where we land is the position we're in today where we've got a multitude of different legal authorities with different reach and scope and different application. Next slide, please, Jason. So just to sort of set some vocabulary, make sure we're all fully aligned. When we're talking about the US sanctions targeting Russia, we're talking about a couple, a couple different flavors. We're talking about so-called primary sanctions. And those are the ones that in the main apply to US persons. So US citizens and, and permanent residents, folks who are actually in the US, uh, US companies and their non-US branches. Uh, and those sanctions, those so-called primary sanctions, they have a couple of different sort of scopes of applicability. Uh, the first is the growing number of blocking sanctions. So that's where the U.S. says, uh, thank you very much. You are now on the specially designated nationals list. Uh, U.S. persons can't do business with you. Your property and interest in property within U.S. jurisdiction are frozen. Uh, and oh, by the way, thanks to our 50% rule, uh, anything you own 50% uh, or greater, directly or indirectly, uh, is also blocked. That's a sort of bedrock US sanctions concept. Uh, it applies in the Russia program, uh, just as it applies in so many others. The Crimea embargo is another key feature of the US sanctions on Russia. Uh, and this is one that's been particularly vexing because it doesn't fit really nicely in any box that we already know about. So uh, there is no US trade embargo on Russia in the way that there is, say, on Cuba or Iran, or North Korea, or Syria, except when it comes to Crimea, where the sanctions look a whole heck of a lot like the sort of you know, typical US embargo, essentially a flat prohibition subject to some exemptions and some licensing authorities. Uh, the last thing I'll mention here, again, because it's unique to Russia, are the sectoral sanctions. Uh, and these are the ones that, uh, in the main, deal with financing restrictions. Um, I say in the main because they also pick up the provision of goods and other than financial services and technology to certain projects that have the potential uh, to produce oil. Uh, and that involves certain Russian entities and certain types of exploration and production projects in certain locations. So uh, if you heard a lot of caveats, that's for a reason, uh, it's to say, it's not a plenary authority. It's not intended to sort of clear the space, uh, but it does have a more tailored scope, uh, albeit one that's very meaningful for folks who get 
caught up in it. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a little graphic here that talks more about some of these sectoral sanctions. Uh, I think the, um, the, the big point to take away from here is you know, the distinction between the blocking sanctions and the Crimea embargo and the sectoral sanctions. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later uh, when we talk about some enforcement actions about how we actually recently saw uh, for the first time in a very public way uh, an enforcement action under Directive 4 of the sectoral sanctions. That's the one that uh, targets energy sector, certain energy sector projects. So we'll talk more about that in a bit. But the key takeaway here is you know, we've got a range of policy concerns, we've got a range of legal authorities, and we've got a range of different types of sanctions and export controls uh, that layer into that. Jason, over to you. Thanks, Peter. Um, so uh, I wanted to talk uh, briefly as well about sort of sanctions, uh, ugly step sibling uh, export controls. Um, the uh, export controls in the United States, um, you know, have a, uh, the, the name export controls is kind of a, a, um, a misleadingly straightforward way of referring to them because U.S. export controls like U.S. sanctions have a broad reach that extends far beyond the boundaries of the United States. Um, and they are also uh, becoming a, an increasingly used tool uh, in, um, in furthering the objectives of sanctions programs and complementing sanctions programs. Um, in the case of countries where we have a comprehensive trade embargo, like Iran and Cuba, um, export controls and sanctions, you know, that there's uh, um, a lot of sort of elements of the sanctions programs that incorporate export controls provisions. Um, and, but in the case of other countries where, like, as Peter said, we don't have a, a comprehensive embargo, such as with Russia, um, export controls have really been used to, uh, to, to, to further goals that are sanctions-like in their appearance. And the way that those have been used in connection with Russia and the way that they may continue to be used, as we'll talk about later, um, are, are interesting. Uh, and I wanna make sure that everyone has a, a sort of a, a basic understanding of how US export, export controls work. So in broad terms, sanctions prohibitions uh, it, kind of apply to it's it, you can think about it in terms of a lot of them apply in terms of what various people and companies can do um, in terms of financial transactions or other, other types of transactions, meaning the jurisdiction of whether sanctions apply to a certain transaction or require a certain person or entity to do or not do a certain thing depends on whether that person or entity is a US person uh, or in some cases owned or controlled by a US person. Um, export controls some of them kind of work like that, but for the most part, they, they tie to the item. So um, uh, they, they depend on whether the item is subject to US export jurisdiction because of where it originated, where it was made, and in some cases, how it was made. Um, so uh, there, are, there have been increasingly tightened restrictions, uh, export control restrictions. The US has two primary export control sets of regulations, the Export Administration Regulations, or EAR, which apply to dual use items, uh, and the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR, which apply to munitions items. Um, not gonna get into all of the details of this, they're incredibly complicated, and that would be, uh, could spend hours talking about them, but, um, Specifically in connection with Russia, the United States has expanded and tightened um, uh, a lot of licensing requirements for U.S. origin items going to Russia. Um, many of them now require an export license, whereas, you know, several years ago, um, many of them may not have. Um, there's also been an expansion targeting military end use and military end users, um, uh, which applies to in connection with specific items, but also in connection with specific end users and end uses. Um, and an interesting feature of that specific expansion with respect to Russia, as well as China and Venezuela, is that um, 
uh, you know, there's a list of military end users and, and military end uses in the export administration regulations. Um, but it's clear from those regulations that exporters have to make their own determination about whether a particular end user end user um, might be military. Um, so that's a that's a significant compliance uh, challenge. Um, uh, the entity list, which is a list of people and companies that can't receive items that are subject to US export control jurisdiction has seen increased use in recent years, um, specifically in connection with uh, Russia, as well as China. Um, and uh, in the last year or so, Russia was added to the uh, what's called the 126.1 list under the ITAR, which essentially uh, precludes uh, the, the, uh, the shipment of uh, defense items to a destination. Um, now, uh, and I think the the response was to that was Russia hasn't bought any defense items from the U.S. in decades or something like that. But um, that that is just an example of how this has been uh, tightened. Um, in addition to uh, what we have here, there's also Peter talked about sectoral sanctions on the energy sector. There are sectoral sanctions under the EAR involving uh, energy projects. Uh, those don't act exactly match up exactly, but um, those, those restrictions have been in place for quite a while. Um, I think, uh, let's see, I'm gonna turn it back to Peter now to talk about our next slide. Back All right, thank, thanks, Jason. Uh, I'm gonna talk for just a second here about secondary sanctions. Um, the reason why I wanna talk about secondary sanctions is particularly for the folks on this call, they're likely to be incredibly relevant. They may not be directly applicable to you uh, in terms of making you subject to U.S. jurisdiction, but uh, by their very design, they're intended to be a part of your risk calculation as you think about doing business uh, in Russia with Russian firms. The basic idea behind secondary sanctions is this is a tool by which the U.S. can impose administrative type penalties on non-U.S. companies, non-U.S. persons who do certain types of business involving uh, uh, Russia. The reason why they're called secondary sanctions as opposed to the primary sanctions, which I talked about earlier, is that these sanctions can be effective even when the US doesn't have legal jurisdiction in the ordinary sense, in the ordinary course, over the person involved. These sanctions can be applied when a non-US company is acting in a way that's perfectly fine, perfectly kosher, under whatever the laws uh, that are ordinarily applicable to that company uh, require or prohibit. Now, we first saw secondary sanctions way back in the 90s in the context of Iran and Libya, uh, and they were very limited. They weren't, uh, they weren't particularly wide in scope, and frankly, they weren't enforced all that aggressively. Uh, but then in the intervening uh, 30 years, We've seen really starting back in 2010 or so with Iran, and then certainly in a dramatic way, increasing over time and sort of you know, starting a new chapter with Katsa, we've seen this increased use by the US of secondary sanctions. And now, as I mentioned, starting with Katsa, we see a significant expansion of secondary sanctions relevant to, or frankly, targeting Russia. So we mention here, uh, two of the multitude of secondary sanctions. Uh, I want to focus on just one in particular. It's a section 228. The reason why I want to focus on 228 is because of the really sort of staggering breadth of its potential scope of applicability. What 228 says in part is that engaging in a so-called significant transaction involving or for the benefit of a person sanctioned under the US-Russia sanctions may be itself a basis for secondary sanctions. And notwithstanding the guidance that's been issued, uh, which gives us at least some sense of the contours of how the US construes that authority, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that, you know, in all fairness, we haven't seen an avalanche of designations under this authority, it is an incredibly aggressive and assertive statement about the types of risk that the US has put on the table 
uh, for so many companies uh, across Europe and frankly, around the world. Next slide, please. So here we've got a little bit of the TikTok of what we've seen in now the first uh, 13 months of the uh, Biden administration. Uh, I'm not gonna go through uh, each and every uh, uh, little piece here. Uh, I do wanna make the point though, that US sanctions, particularly US sanctions with respect to Russia are anything but static. Uh, I was only sort of half joking when I said at the beginning that who knows if our PowerPoint will still be good by the time we finish this discussion. Um, and so we wanted to include a slide here just to give everyone a little bit of sense about some of the comings and goings uh, in US sanctions with respect to Russia uh, over the last year or so. Um, uh, uh, but you know, again, the, the key takeaway here is that they are dynamic, that they change, that they can change very quickly without any advance notice, uh, and that um, uh, that's why the discussions like the one we're having today are so important. Uh, because it is very much a moving target. Next slide, please. So here is a few more here are a few more examples of uh, of some of the developments in the Russia sanctions uh, over the last year or so. Uh, I want to make two points here. Uh, uh, the first is with respect to this sort of bottom set of bullet points about Cameron International. Uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago when we were talking about the sectoral sanctions that we finally saw a public enforcement action under Directive 4. That's the one that targets the energy sector. Uh, this is that enforcement action. Um, what's interesting here is based on the publicly available information, the role of the US person. So you know, why is why is a set of transactions between a non-US company, a Romanian company, uh, uh, and Gazprom Neft Shelf of interest? How does the US have jurisdiction? What does it mean? And the net net is that according to the publicly available information, there were US person managers who were involved in approving these transactions and signing off on them even though the transactions were done by a non-US company. Uh, why is that meaningful for the rest of us? Well, it's meaningful for the rest of us because it goes to a really fundamental compliance point, which is the idea of ring fencing, the idea of keeping your US persons separate and apart from non-US persons to protect the company certainly to protect those people individually, but to protect the company from walking into a situation like the one here, where if there were no US persons involved, you very likely wouldn't have seen an enforcement action. So uh, that's the first takeaway. Second takeaway here is more broadly applicable um, than meets the eye. And that's this point about uh, the, um, the cryptocurrency exchange enforcement action here. I mentioned cryptocurrency uh, both because it is one of the types of new technologies, new methods of exchange that the US is very much focused on understanding and figuring out from a sanctions perspective. Um, and I mention it because one of the things that we've seen from the US over the last year or so has been a very clear theme, which is to say, that the US has been reasonably clear across a range of pronouncements having to do with cryptocurrency that they expect companies, at least US person companies, to take into consideration from a compliance perspective, all of the information that they gather from a business perspective. So the example that comes up a lot, including with crypto, is the idea that when you are dealing in crypto payments, you have IP addresses of the counterparties and you have the ability to geolocate those IP addresses. And what is interesting in the guidance and the other pronouncements from OFAC is this expectation that with that information, you will be able to identify uh, 
higher risk or even prohibited payments. So I mention that here because, as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, in the event that the Russian financial sector uh, is no longer able to avail itself of systems like SWIFT and things like crypto become more attractive, um, these are the types of things that the U.S. has actually increasingly been focused on understanding and addressing from a sanctions compliance perspective uh, over the last year or so. Um, with that, Jason, let me turn it to you for slide 11. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Um, so again, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on um, sort of what's happened. By the way, um, we didn't distribute these slides in advance of the program, but they uh, we can make them available to anyone who wants a copy um, following, the, following the presentation. Um, but uh, sort of in the latter part of last year, the beginning part of this year, there were a few notable uh, developments that illustrate some of the points that we're talking about at least. So um, one of those is in addition to the entity list that sort of goes back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of export controls. Um, you know, uh, being included on the entity list generally means that a person uh, or an entity uh, can't receive anything that's uh, called the, the, the term, the regulatory term is subject to the EAR. Um, and that generally refers to uh, anything that originated in the United States. Um, as well as um, certain foreign made items uh, that are either made from or incorporate certain types of US origin content. Um, that, uh, that concept that I just described in terms of foreign made items is something that we're gonna talk about a little bit later uh, in terms of where things might be headed. Um, the, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, again, we see, we also see a, a cryptocurrency designation, a cryptocurrency exchange designation, uh, in, in response to ransomware attacks. Um, you know, this is it's important to keep this in mind too, because um, you know there have been reports about uh, malicious cyber activity affecting Ukraine. Um, you know, as as uh, I think we all know. Um, some of the rhetoric uh, has cooled slightly. There have been reports of, um, you know, troop withdrawals or um, movements away from 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 Ukraine, uh, and sort of discussions headed in a more favorable direction in terms of diplomacy. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to remember that you know this is the 21st century, and um, uh, there can be uh, uh, offensive maneuvers that are that don't involve things that go boom um so uh and um and 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 finally uh so actually uh, with that i'm going to go to the next slide so um a couple of other sort of moving pieces here um in terms of you know wh where things have been and where things might be going north stream 2 despite being essentially completed um is still very much a, a hot topic of discussion in terms of where U.S. sanctions um, are headed. There are certain uh, hawkish uh, members of Congress in terms of sanctions um, that are that are uh, quite intent on uh, incorporating uh, in, in, in imposing sanctions related to Nord Stream. Um, and uh, as we'll discuss uh, at the end of the presentation, um, you know, intent on in including that in certain legislation about about sanctions. Um, you know, the U.S. approach uh, with respect to Nord Stream, and uh, it has been quite quite temperate, uh, and, and not nearly what some members of Congress would 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 like it to be. Uh, and the reason for that uh, are the the reasons for that are many, but they involve uh, a lot of them involve. Um, not taking actions with sanctions that would uh, harm our allies, such as such as Germany. Um, I, I should also add here, uh, th in this context, just as a scene setter with respect to, um, you know, the way sanctions work in the United States. Uh, when I'm talking about the sort of tug of war between Congress and the administration, you know, Congress can pass legislation that. Uh, either expresses a desire for certain things to happen or 
direct certain things to happen. But fundamentally, um, the decision of whether to impose sanctions uh, and how to impose them ultimately lies with the president and the secretary of the treasury under which OFAC is. So um, when we talk about some of the, the tensions between what certain members of Congress might be advocating for and what actually happens, uh, this is what we're seeing in practice. So, you know, here we have Congress passing multiple laws that require the imposition of sanctions um, involving Nord Stream, but, but effectively what's happened is that the, the executive branch, essentially both under Trump and Biden, have sort of declined to, to go all in on that. Um, uh, sanctions were waived uh, last year against imposing sanctions on, on individuals involved in Nord Stream. Um, but certain vessels were, were added to the SDN list. Um, I also want to mention briefly that, uh, you know, the, the role of and position of Belarus with respect to Russia sanctions. Obviously, Belarus and Russia are two different countries. Um, but they are, you know, closely aligned, um, and uh, the uh, there has been an escalation of sanctions against Belarus and executive orders issued by the president targeting senior officials in Belarus, adding them to the SDN list, uh, restricting dealing in sovereign debt of Belarus um, in response to both, you know, acts that that uh, the government of Belarus has taken. Um, but also having to do with the um, sort of uh, alliance between Belarus and Russia. Um, and this is, you know, this is the, the focus of what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time is, is really on Russia. But I think it's important to keep in mind that um, what happens with respect to Russia and Ukraine, to the extent that it also involves Belarus, can involve additional sanctions on Belarus as well. Um, I think, Peter, this is over to you for, for this one, right? And then back to me. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so, great. Uh, now is the, the sort of the fun part, if I could use that term, where we get to gaze into our crystal ball and make predictions that uh, regrettably are being recorded and inevitably will turn out to be uh, maybe at best partially accurate. Um, here's the key point. The U.S., without needing to pass any new law issue, any new regulation, uh, do any sort of tap dancing around the legal authorities, uh, already has sufficient, significant authorities to expand, impose, alter, modify, make more severe sanctions and export controls targeting Russia. Whether there is or is not new legislation, does not really affect that calculus. And what we've seen over the last couple of days has been a, a shift in focus away from the new so-called mother of all Russia sanctions legislation that the uh, chairman of the Center Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Menendez, uh, had prepared, and instead a new focus on more of a messaging piece, a resolution uh, either by the House and the Senate or by the Senate and separately by the House, calling on the President of the United States to use existing legal authorities to intensify sanctions uh, targeting Russia. Uh, the, you know, the change in that focus, it, it's, it's really hard to assign one particular reason for it. Uh, I think for purposes of our discussion today, uh, the key takeaway, though, is that even in the absence of new legislation, there is already ample legal authority to do everything that was in that legislation uh, and more. And where we find ourselves now is in a position where the question in the U.S. is, is it too late to deter the Russians from whatever it is that they're planning? or? Is it not strategically wise to try to deter the Russians, even if it is possible, uh, and instead focus on more of a punitive response? Or does it make sense to sort of do an everything, including the kitchen sink approach, and simply say, okay, 
Uh, we're going to try to deter Russia. If that doesn't work, we're going to punish Russia um, uh, and go from there. Um, what makes it such a challenge for all of the corporates, everyone trying to do business, is that uh, because the legal authority is already in place, it is, as Jason very rightly mentioned just a little bit ago, essentially at the discretion of the President of the United States, what to do, when to do it, how soon to make it effective, and what to target, uh, let alone who to give an accommodation to in terms of a wind down or a phase in or uh, anything of that sort. Um, we have seen over the last couple of days and weeks in, here in Washington, uh, a number of ideas bandied about, about what the U.S. could do, what the U.S. might do, even what the U.S. should do. And certainly uh, everyone on this uh, discussion has seen a number of these things, whether they talk about pressuring SWIFT to disconnect some or all Russian banks, uh, whether it's about expanded designation authorities, including targeting the president of Russia, his family members, uh, and other uh, additional senior Russian officials and high net worth Russians, um, whether it's uh, using this sort of novel tool that Jason will talk about called the foreign direct product rule to try to uh, essentially choke off Russia's ability to source uh, U.S. origin goods and services and technology that are necessary for Russian industry. Uh, there have been a lot of ideas that have been bandied about. Uh, the key takeaway, though, is that the U.S. administration has not signaled exactly what it is interested in doing or when. Uh, partially, that's by design. You, know, you don't necessarily want to telegraph your every move. Um, but what the U.S. has said and has been very clear about uh, you know, as recently as yesterday, probably this morning, if, if, if you know, we were to pick up the paper right now, is that whatever the US does is going to be intended to be painful, going to be intended to be materially bigger, more aggressive, more impactful than what the response was in 2014. And, and this is the part that I think is really interesting. Um, the US has also made clear over the last few days that we recognize that whatever we do with respect to Russia very well might mean that um, that there are some unintended negative consequences for Americans and American companies. Uh, you don't often hear that type of acknowledgement by the U.S. when we're considering a big ticket sanctions package. And so, um, you know, with, with that um, uh, portrait painted of, of where we are today, let me turn it now uh, back to Jason to talk a little bit more about what are some of the ideas that have been bandied about uh, in terms of what might come. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, so, um, as Peter said, and as I said, um, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, ultimately, it's up to the administration. Uh, the administration is has has really been very quiet in terms of. Uh, what it might be considering, except to say that it, it's quite, it's going to be painful, but there has been certain messaging, um, both from the administration and from Congress, which, depending on who you talk to, um, may or may not reflect a certain degrees of coordination with the administration regarding what the administration is considering or is willing to do, um, that I think provides a you know, a glimpse into the realm of the possible. You know, what's actually done, obviously, could be different. Um, if anything is done at all, um, the trigger is 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 significantly up in the air. But let's just go through some of the more significant potential actions that we've heard about. So, um, one such uh, measure uh, uh, it, that reflects some contemplated measures is is a bill that has been introduced in both chambers of the U.S. Congress um, last month uh, called the Defending Ukraine Sovereignty Act of 2022. Um, it has not moved in Congress, um, as as Peter said. Um, the uh, it doesn't need to move. It doesn't need to be enacted, um, and uh, it may not ever be enacted. Um, there's some talk that it it it's it. You know, it, it might just 
not move forward. But nevertheless, it, um, it, it again for the reasons that we said, it doesn't need to. Uh, what it does is it is it it's a telegraph, a message of of sort of what might happen and when. So, first question uh, is is when, right? And again, this is entirely up to the to the administration's discretion. Um, the language of the statute, which reflects the sense of when of Congress in terms of when sanctions should be imposed, is whether the government, the Russian government, uh, is engaged in or knowingly supporting a significant escalation uh, in or against Ukraine, and and whether it's intended to undermine the sovereignty of Ukraine. Uh, you know, now again, as I mentioned earlier, um, everyone talks about the um, the you know hot war types of uh, situations and escalations. Um, this doesn't ne necessitate that the trigger for this be um, an actual military, military, you know, uh, uh, munitions-based attack. Uh, it, it could involve other types of measures as well. But what it contemplates is a significant escalation. And the the line in the sand, so to speak, to use a, an overused and ill-fated term, uh, or the stake in the ground, rather, is in connection with you know, the passage date of the legislation. So the idea is that you're supposed to, you know, figure out a specific point in time at which the situation is X. And then, you know, if there's a significant escalation above that, that's the appropriate time for opposing san imposing sanctions. Um, the bill sets out a number of sanctions measures. Some of them are mandatory, which uh, means that Congress thinks that the president has to impose those sanctions if certain conditions are met, um, and the uh, um, and some of them are, are are discretionary, meaning that the the you know the president doesn't quote unquote have to impose them, uh, but again, uh, ultimately this is almost always left to the discretion of the of the president. So uh, even when a sanction is quote unquote mandatory, uh, the president can always waive imposition of sanctions because he determines that it's in the national interest of the United States, as happened with uh, Nord Stream 2. Um, but I think undeniably the most disruptive and, and consequential potential action in this law, and that, and that is presumably being considered, is the imposition of blocking sanctions on Russian financial institutions. Um, there's 12 of them listed in the legislation. The legislation requires, would require, uh, blocking sanctions to be imposed on three or more of them, uh, as well as their subsidiaries and successors. Um, many and and you know, as you can see, these are significant Russian financial institutions. Um, they there are many of them are already subject to some form of sanctions, sectoral sanctions primarily. Um, sec uh, there are only a couple of Russian banks that are actually subject to blocking sanctions. But if blocking sanctions were to be imposed on um, any of these financial institutions, um, it, the, the, the consequence would be to effectively prohibit U.S. persons, and which includes U.S. banks, from engaging in any transactions with these banks. And that would include making payments to them on behalf of a uh, third party who has an account at the bank, um, absent some kind of authorization. Uh, and presumably, to something Peter mentioned earlier, uh, it, it, it would also carry secondary sanctions risk to uh, non-US persons and banks by application of uh, Section 228 of CATSA. Um, this would obviously be extremely uh, disruptive uh, and, 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 and really cause problems for financial transactions involving Russia and, and Russian companies. Um, uh, there are also provisions to target certain industries uh, in, in sectors of the Russian economy, um, resource extraction primarily. Um, this, as it's stated in this statute, this would require sort of a two-level determination from the president. Again, echoing that theme of it's ultimately up to the president to decide. So the first is, is this business engaged in this sector of the Russian economy? And the second is, if it is engaged in that sector, is it in the uh, uh, national security interest of the United States to impose sanctions on, on that entity? So that could potentially be consequential. Uh, I, what I understand is a major sticking point in this 
proposed legislation is again the effort to require sanctions on Nord Stream 2 and people involved in it. Um, it, it I've, I've heard uh, that that is a uh, uh, has been a, a sort of impediment to this moving forward, um, but it does contain a provision that would require imposition of sanctions on Nord Stream 2. I think it's safe to say that that the administration's appetite for that is quite low. For the reasons discussed, uh, there is a provision of uh, imposing uh, or, or authorizing discretionary sanctions on providers of specialized financial messaging services such as SWIFT. Um, you know, this is a common uh, refrain in, in U.S. sanctions. Uh, it, you know the SWIFT, SWIFT disconnection. Um, ultimately, whether sanctions can be imposed on SWIFT uh, or, or other financial messaging services uh, is uh, not. Up to the United States, SWIFT is not a U.S. Um, or not imposing sanctions, but you know, SWIFT disconnection is ultimately not up to the United States. It's you know, not a U.S. It's not a U.S. entity. But the intent of this is to suggest that there might be some consequences to a non-U.S. provider of financial messaging services if they continue to do it. Um, you know, again, uh, there's a lot of different ways of moving money into and out of a country without using a specific financial messaging service, especially with the advent of cryptocurrency. So, um, you know, that's sort of a uh, I, that's sort of fourth on this list because I kind of rank these in order of potential consequences to to, to people and likelihood of occurring. So, um, th that's sort of a but that that is in there. Whether it's a, a real a real issue or whether it's going to happen, I think is significantly up in the air, uh, including that they're discretionary. Um, there's also additional sovereign debt prohibitions. Uh, there are existing sovereign debt prohibitions, but this would expand them, um, and uh, mandatory blocking sanctions on senior members of the uh, the Russian government, um, which is intended more as a, you know a direct pressure on decision makers in Russia, but not necessarily that relevant for people who aren't those people. Um, so that's sort of the overview of those sanctions measures. I do want to talk briefly about something that Peter mentioned. I don't have a slide on it, but this is this is a, uh, a this is something where uh, senior unnamed senior government officials in the in the United States executive branch have mentioned this as a possibility. Um, and that is an expansion of US export controls using uh, what are called the de minimis rule and the foreign direct product rule. Um, as I mentioned, US export controls apply to items um, uh, based on whether they are subject to the EAR. The foreign direct product rule and the de minimis rule are two rules in the export administration regulations that allow US export controls to apply to goods that are made outside the United States but that either contain a certain amount of US controlled uh, components or technology or software, that's the de minimis rule, um, and or are produced from, directly from, uh, certain software or technology of US origin. Uh, that's the foreign direct product rule. Now, the foreign direct product rule um, has historically applied only to certain uh, fairly sensitive types of items, uh, both in terms of the technology used to make them and the end item that's produced from them. However, the United States recently, within the last year and a half, I think it's been, um, changed the way that that rule applies to further target Huawei um, because of um, the way that certain companies were um, continuing to be able to do business with Huawei despite placing them on the entity list um, by using, um, you know, by using U.S. origin technology in a way that wasn't yet captured by the regulations. So essentially what the U.S. did was, remember how I said, it's, it, it's historically applied to fairly sensitive technology, fairly sensitive end items. The U.S. just essentially kind of reduced the sensitivity threshold of the end items and the uh, and the technology to expand its use, but only in the context of Huawei and Huawei listed entities. Um, there has been explicit acknowledgement, as well as reports in the press, that the U.S. is considering doing that as well in connection with Russia. How exactly that would work is not known, um, but it's a um, 
it's it's something to consider. Uh, and uh, sort of with that, um, you know, I, I will just say that, you know, we, we, we will continue to watch this space and watch the news uh, and see what happens. Um, and uh, and uh, hopefully, um, I, ho I think I speak for all of us, hopefully none of this will happen and we'll just kind of remain uh, at the status quo or even improve on the status quo. Um, but uh, it's good that we're talking about this now so that people can uh, get an understanding of what might happen if things uh, uh, escalate or get worse. So um, with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues in, um, uh, in, in Brussels and Moscow, Nadia and Konstantin. Uh, and uh, we and we'll be happy to take questions uh, at the end if that's uh, if that's what people would like. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jason, Peter, for a very dynamic and uh, very interesting uh, presentation of so serious things. And I will happy to pass now the floor to Nadia and uh, uh, Konstantin. Uh, I was. I just uh, read it that uh, Nadia was a specialist also of the World Trade Organization and how all these sanctions go uh, together with this, uh, let's say, rules of freedom in the, uh, in the commerce. Please, Nadia. Thank you very much, Oleg. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. My name is Nadia Nachai, and I'm a partner with the law firm of Dentons here in Brussels. Um, uh, Jason, Peter, and Kostya are my dear friends over uh, now many, many years. Our sanctions-based practice in Brussels uh, has been recognized in Legal 500, and it is especially important to me to acknowledge my wider team who assist me across the European Union and my wonderful colleagues who you had the privilege of hearing to right now, but also Kostya, who is to speak after me. Um, we have gone out of the way to try to put together a practice that can serve our clients across the globe and that focuses on really aspects of making business possible across jurisdictions. So um, we have also in putting together the presentation today, um, Kostya and I, we don't have a slide. And I think the reason for that was primarily because we wanted to have a vivid conversation with you about uh, the situation at hand and the risks that you may be facing and the concerns you may be having. So please feel free to ask questions of uh, that may relate to my segment of uh, statements or maybe to Peter's and Jason's or to Kostya's. You can do this even in between, just uh, let Oleg know and we'll give you the floor. So um, our goal in preparing this event has been to help members of the chamber who, by the way, some of our, uh, our, our clients, thank you very much for being with us has been to help you understand the situation better and to maybe try and prognosticate to a little degree what may come should things escalate. Now, Peter and Jason have said that we're really in the realm of holding a crystal ball, but there are some pointers and markers that have helped us decipher many sources that we put together in order to give you a sense of what may develop should things go wrong. Um, and. I think what's interesting is in preparing for the consequences of EU sanctions, if they were to be adopted new sanctions targeting Russia, there is one interesting feature that I think all of our clients are familiar with, but also if you're a business person operating in the European space and having business in sanctions jurisdictions um, uh, by the European Union, you know that European sanctions regime contain the so-called grandfathering in provisions. So the advantage of these grandfathering in provisions is that uh, basically the, uh, the new rule, the new sanctions rule, will only concern the new events. And the old events, so anything that is in place today, will be protected under grandfathering in provisions. So this is the old rules continue to apply to old situations and that are ongoing. Now, of course, this is the great ease because whatever happens, if it happens, there will be this sort of, if you will, a small safeguard with respect to your business as it stands today. But that safeguard is not absolute in its effect because there are some procedural uh, obligations that are attached to exercising your grandfathering in rights. In particular, you would need to approach competent authorities in the EU member state to ask for a license to or authorization to continue to, for instance, deliver your goods or services under existing contracts. 
And in some cases, such authorizations could be granted. In some cases, there will be a more of a very restrictive approach and reading to what is strictly necessary for the contract to continue. So if you have long-term contracts in place that may be affected by the new sanctions, not all of them will be able to survive through the grandfathering in. They will only survive in sort of in the initial impact of sanctions. Um, one thing to also note is that uh, similarly to the United States, in the European Union, the rhetoric in relation to the potential conflict has been escalating and has been escalating from all corners of the European Union. What's interesting is while initially when these escalations in rhetoric have happened, there was difficulty to see a uniform voice. In fact, there has been leak uh, in the media about how different member states use this, the situation differently, as well as how aggressive each one is prepared to be in terms of capturing uh, the negative effects. There seems to be today uh, an understanding as to what exactly the European Union is planning to do. And it is my reading of everything that we've been hearing is that the European Union does today have a plan in terms of what we will do in the first wave, what we will do in the second wave, and what we will do in the third wave. So when you hear the rhetoric on the news before you get panicked, I think you have to put it into the context of events on the ground. So any conflict is typically divided in three stages. There is a stage of conflict, conflict brewing. So this has been happening over a number of years. There is a stage of conflict escalation, and then there is a stage of conflict de-escalation. What I think the rhetoric has been helping European Union achieve, at least that's what they're hoping, by telling um, the counterparts that we are eager to react in case of escalation of the events on the ground, is to prevent the conflict from happening. So the rhetoric has been high because its purpose is not to really scare, but to maybe try to prevent, to deter something from happening. So there is hope that this will have effect. Um, another thing that's important and I've been observing is that the same rhetoric coming from the European Union in multiple instances has been referring to a consorted effort by the partners internationally. Why is that important? Well, it is important because unlike the United States, any sanctions adopted by the European Union vis-a-vis -vis Russia will hurt badly European businesses because the business connections between Russia and the European Union are stronger in terms of economic value of trade. Uh, the, they are immeasurable compared to the United States. So what I think is very important is that we are to view US potential new US sanctions targeting Russia and potential new EU sanctions targeting Russia as a single jigsaw. It's pieces together forming one part, one portrait. And the reason why it's important is because in talking to one another, the United States and the EU somehow happen to agree or determine what measures the United States can adopt that will not necessarily badly hurt US businesses, but if you, EU were to adopt them, they would hurt the EU businesses far more than EU would be willing to accept. So I'll give you an example of something that Peter and Jason had spoken about, something that has been discussed as a possible recourse by the US authorities, and that is to a um, uh, banning some sectors of Russian economy from SWIFT. Now, I needless to say that this will badly hurt everybody. But I think what's interesting is where United States able to do that, even if the EU is unable to adopt the same measure, it's enough that US adopts that measure because of the way US sanctions work and operate and the long arm of the US sanctions, it will help hurt Russian economy, even if the EU does not adopt an equivalent symmetrical measure. Another example of this desired symmetry um, is in the space of energy sanctions. We know from German statements how sensitive German economy is, but European Union generally to energy sector and energy related sanctions. What's interesting there, again, is that when United States and EU talk to each other, they have a better vision of how can they tailor their sanctions response in a way that wouldn't necessarily, wouldn't hurt European partners more than necessary, but would allow your United States to act in a way that would hurt the Russian Federation. So all of this tells me that there is no um, 
that the counterparts are very sincere when they say that we have coordinated our approaches. I think that everybody is very much aware of what would come at this point if things were to escalate. But what's interesting is, and that there is a reason for it, is that European Union tries to be very, to keep everything under the wraps. And there are only some glimpses of statements about, about what sanctions could look like. Now, there was one announcement that came from the council on the January 24th, where the council said, that we uh, will formulate sanctions that will be massive and have a severe cost. And they say that this will be a wide array of sanctions, sectoral and individual, and that they would be adopted in consideration with the partners. So there will be some symmetry, but there will be a necessary asymmetry in order to reflect the difference in the economic value of trade between EU and the Russian Federation and United States and the Russian Federation. That's one thing. But another thing is that um, even to the extent to which uh, we don't know today what exactly the financial sanctions or new financial sanctions or new energy sanctions are look like, we actually can predict some of the effects. So Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, has spoken, I think, as late as yesterday or day before yesterday, confirming that financial sanctions are in the menu and confirming that further energy sanctions are in the menu. Uh, and we'll speak more on that later. But um, uh, maybe it would be uh, opportune to take one step at a time and talk about um, what are the sanctions today uh, in broad terms and then delve into what they could be. Uh, generally, when European Union sanctions were first adopted, as you know, there was almost a certain level of um, uncertainty and also a learning curve that businesses had to go through in order to uh, adapt their practices to the new reality of sanctions. Today, I think as far as European Union sanctions are concerned, I understand there is a very big amount of knowledge already and know-how within the businesses in terms of how European Union sanctions work. Um, so I will not go through the granular details of EU sanctions. I will only repeat that EU has in place the following general body of sanctions. There are sanctions that are sectoral, that target financial, energy, military, and dual use sectors. There are Crimean related sanctions, and there are several individual sanctions and programs that target uh, specific events of individuals, such as you know the poisoning of Mr. Navalny or other human rights violations. Most recently, there was a Wagner Group designation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so while European Union sanctions are generally easily understood, the complexity of these st sanctions stems from the fact that the way European Union sanctions are implemented differs from member state to member state. So while you may have a clear idea of what is written in the law, the way that law, the regulation is applied on the ground in France, Germany, Cyprus, Poland, uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands would differ. And one point I would like to make in this connection is that there has been um, a, uh, I think, misperception on the part of some of the commentators about the rigorous nature or lack of rigorous nature on the part of enforcement authorities in the European Union. I can confirm that such perceptions are unfounded and that EU is really strict about compliance with EU sanctions and some authorities have really become the hawk of compliance even after the United Kingdom has left the European Union. So this body of sanctions that we have today uh, is in place until July, 2022. It has been extended in January and it focuses on the four sectors that I've just described. Um, these sanctions have originally been also coordinated with the United States, but there are some notable differences, key differences. So first of all, there is nothing in the EU sanctions that relates to Russia gas focused projects. And that is not surprising. Why? Because of the European Union's dependency on the supplies of Russian gas. So there have been a few signals that tell me that today, at least as viewed by the European Union, um, energy sanctions, further and stricter energy sanctions are not off the menu. More importantly, even gas is not excluded. How do I come to that conclusion? Uh, while I think that sanctions on gas will not come in the first or second way of response, it is in the menu as the ultimate possible response to sanctions. Equally important, European Union is prepared in case they were to adopt sanctions against Russia, they are prepared for possible Russia's response 
in curtailing supplies of gas. Uh, how does that come together? Well, Ursula von der Leyen has made statements to that effect. She said that, um, you know, gas supplies from the Russian Federation are important to us, but they're far more important for the Russian Federation. She also said in trying to speak to the community at large and to the people of the European Union, she said that, well, we have enough gas supply for this year for this heating season. So that tells me they are in their mind prepared for the economic effects that may impact gas sector, be it through the individual sanctions adopted by the European Union or from possible counter sanctions that your Russian Federation would be eager to adopt should they be unhappy with the sanctions adopted. Um, but I do think that this tells me that when she talks about possible energy sanctions, she accepts the possibility that there will be hierarchy in the sanctions that she will pursue. She will not go and target um, uh, at gas right away, but she may start somewhere else. Um, a second important feature that is different and distinguishes EU and US sanctions that were originally coordinated is that there are no sanctions at present on any oil and gas projects with Russian participation that are outside Russia, right? So that could change. That is another area, a field where something could happen that would align EU sanctions closer to the US um, sanctions then there is nothing to be said and spoken about the corresponding bank accounts that have been protected so far from the impact of EU sanctions. That could also change. And also similarly, unlike US sanctions, EU sanctions at present do not have a far reaching sort of SDN blocking type of sanctions on key European uh, Russian businesses and CEOs. That too can change. So if you were looking to see what could be the pool from which EU would seek more severe sanctions, this is where I would, I would suggest you, you begin. Uh, in terms of cl closer look on possible new financial sanctions, in addition to the five fi Russian banks that are already subject to financial sanctions, I think EU could look at the banks that will be designated by the United States. So there'll be further coordination in terms of additional banks being nominated. So this, this won't be just Sberbank, VTB, Gazprom Bank, VEB, uh, Roshel Host Bank, and the Russian Agricultural Bank. It could be more. Um, and, uh, and there'll be potentially further sanctions in uh, energy companies and banks, potentially further designations um, in terms of individuals that would be uh, business uh, business leaders or anyone that has, you know, a, a say in the Russian economy generally. Now, if you're faced with this uh, insane reality of escalation of events, what should you do to prepare yourself for the effects of possible sanctions? Well, I think the first recommendation we have is that you have to do the inventory of your current business relationship with Russian stakeholders, and you have to pay specific attention to dealing with state-owned enterprises and some, you know, emblematic businesses in the Russian Federation because they may come in the sort of round of victims um, where you to adopt sanctions. You should uh, try and evaluate the nature of your contracts. What is the business in which you operate? What are the goods you're supplying? Could they be targeted? When I was thinking more sort of um, in the freestyle manner about what are the sectors that could potentially be newly added to the uh, EU sanctions, I thought of transportation sector because it isn't one that is at present targeted and it may be one that may be less of a, you know, uh, uh, bleeding sector for the European stakeholders. So maybe this is where portions of EU sanctions could uh, mushroom. Um, look at your contracts from the point of view of what are um, terms of payment, because if banks were to be sanctioned, you may have difficulty either expatriating funds from the Russian Federation or be, being paid. So prepare yourself in terms of understanding how much money do you owe somebody and how much money somebody owes to you so that you can, you know, at least have an idea of risk which you're facing. Um, and then also evaluate your termination clauses, uh, exit scenarios, dispute resolution to try and prepare in case, you know, in case you would need to go to any litigation with your counterparts that you, you know where, where you are. 
And I think without further ado, I can, I'm ready to give it over to Costa to talk further about Russian counter sanctions. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I propose that after Konstantin uh, speeches, we will close the recording and then we'll pass to the Q&A. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Oleg, and uh, uh, I'd like to thank Nadia and Peter and Jason, uh, my colleagues who set a, a great uh, framework and foundation for uh, our discussion. So in the interest of time, I will try to be concise because uh, we don't have that much time left. So, uh, so I'm, uh, as my colleagues, I'm a partner with Denton, so I'm dual qualified as a Russian advocate and English solicitor and uh, I worked in London for many years, but I'm based in Moscow now. And uh, sanctions is part, part of my practice, but not my entire practice. I'm uh, heading Denton's Russian corporate and m and practice, and I'm also an arbitrator. So uh, in the context of uh, our discussion, so uh, uh, colleagues have very well set out the essence of US sanctions, European sanctions, the interplay, and I think that it's quite clear how complex this area is and that the sanctions are uh, multiple. They, they're not contained in any one piece of law and that makes it, and also there is quite a bit of unpredictability, which also makes it very difficult uh, to our clients and for businesses doing business in Russia or with Russian counterparts. Now, uh, I think that what, uh, what was not addressed so far and what you wouldn't see in mass media, which talks about sanctions a lot these days, is that uh, when we talk about US sanctions and uh, EU sanctions, British sanctions, uh, but no one says anything about potential Russian response to sanctions. However, from the standpoint of businesses uh, on the ground in Russia and doing business with Russia, a potential response by Russia could be quite important uh, and relevant to what they do. And uh, unlike uh, the US and the EU who have uh, explained uh, to the world uh, at length as what their potential sanctions may look like, uh, Russia has been very silent as to what it might do in response. So Russia has not indicated at all what the response might be. However, uh, it would be prudent to expect that if there are new sanctions, in particular, if there are very harsh sanctions, which are more severe than anything that we've seen so far, uh, it might be reasonable to expect that Russia may also respond and that response may be also uh, uh, more serious than anything we've seen before. And, uh, what kind of uh, countermeasures Russia may uh, implement? Well, uh, again, we, we don't have a crystal ball, but uh, we can look in, in the past. We can look at what Russia has done in the past uh, uh, in response to sanctions. And uh, I would draw your attention to 2018, when there were two interesting uh, legislative uh, initiatives in, in Russia in the form of uh, draft laws that were proposed. One was adopted, the other was not. The one that was adopted in the first reading uh, uh, had some uh, very uh, serious restrictions proposed by members of parliament. And these restrictions included restrictions on foreign owned businesses to do business with Russian state owned companies and enterprises. It purported to restrict uh, uh, international law firms and con consulting firms and uh, big four to uh, provide services to Russian state-owned uh, companies and state organizations. So there were some very serious measures proposed, but uh, luckily in the end, all that was watered down and the law that was ultimately adopted uh, generally just merely uh, authorized Russian government to implement measures that they may see fit. And, and of course, in practice, Russian government, even without that law, already has uh, quite a, a lot of authority on what they can do. Uh, so, uh, so, but the, the very first drafts can give us an indication of what they might do again uh, if, uh, if there are uh, the right circumstances. Now, um, the other uh, draft law, which 
which uh, didn't didn't have much support and didn't go uh, far, uh, uh, purported to introduce changes to the uh, Russian Criminal Code, uh, making it a crime to uh, implement sanctions. And when I say implement, it doesn't mean imp imposing sanctions like states do, but rather uh, affecting sanctions or uh, just uh, uh, following all the sanctions. In other words, in practice, if if there is a company uh, which needs to comply with the US or EU sanctions and uh, officers uh, and employees of that company need to do something to implement the sanctions. For example, as Corey described, that might mean stopping doing business with counterparties or stopping banking with a, a Russian bank, which has become an SDN. So should that draft law be adopted, it would be a crime uh, as a matter of Russian criminal law uh, to do so, to implement the sanctions. And that, that could potentially have cat catastrophic uh, effect on uh, anything on, on the ground in Russia. Of, of course, that would be a problem, not just uh, for the foreign companies, but for the Russian companies as well. Uh, and, and that draft law, it didn't go anywhere. So uh, it was not supported. It was not adopted. However, uh, it was once uh, on the table at the Russian parliament. So uh, that means that it may come back again. So uh, something just to, to, to bear in mind. Uh, and then uh, I would like to uh, dedicate the sec second half of my uh, little presentation to uh, uh, to the issue of uh, uh, disputes and arbitrability, because uh, one of the measures that, that was taken by the Russian government in the context of response to sanctions uh, was making changes to the Russian uh, commercial court procedure code, or as we call it, arbitrage procedure code, uh, effectively granting Russian state courts exclusive jurisdiction uh, over disputes involving sanctioned entities. So that means that means that if uh, uh, if you have a contract with the Russian counterparty and you have uh, uh, you have included an arbitration clause uh, opting to arbitrate uh, in outside of the Russian Federation. And if your Russian counterparty uh, has become sanctioned, and uh, that would include both blocking and uh, sectoral san sanctions or any type of sanctions, uh, th that means that the Russian counterparty may bring a claim in the Russian court, notwithstanding uh, uh, that you have an arbitration clause. And if uh, a non-sanctioned party would continue arbitrating outside Russia, then uh, the Russian party, which is sanctioned, may ask for an anti-suit injunction and uh, uh, Russian court for, for the first time in the history of doctrine of Russian law, that was not an, uh, uh, an instrument available before. So Russian court can now grant an anti-suit injunction. Uh, of course, such anti-suit injunction may not be enforceable outside Russia. And uh, you may argue that uh, uh, any non-Russian arbitral institution and uh, arbitral tribunal is likely to ignore uh, that anti-suit injunction and that you may well be able to proceed arbitrating outside Russia. Having said that, the Russian court may then impose a penalty in the amount of the entire amount in dispute plus costs. And that uh, penalty would be payable for the benefits of the sanctioned party, not to the Russian state. And then again, uh, uh, that penalty imposed by the Russian court may not be enforceable outside of the Russian Federation. However, if you have any assets on the ground in Russia, and that would include bank accounts, that would include uh, uh, shares in your subsidiaries uh, uh, or anything else that you might have in Russia, that, uh, that would be exposed uh, uh, and the decision of Russian court penalty uh, uh, could be uh, enforced against these assets. And, and of course, an arbitral award that you may receive outside of Russia won't be enforceable in Russia because Russian court would say that it's contrary to the Russian public policy uh, and it, it, it won't grant recognition and enforcement. Now, uh, initially, when these changes were made back in 2020, uh, initially Russian courts took a view that in order to, uh, for these provisions to apply, the sanctioned party needs to prove that 
uh, sanctions limits uh, uh, their access to justice because the way provisions of the law were awarded that it's not the imposition of sanctions in itself, uh, but uh, uh, lack of access to justice uh, uh, should enable the sanctioned party to have this protection. However, at the end of last year in December, there was uh, a somewhat unexpected intervention by uh, the Russian Supreme Court, which uh, has uh, overturned the direction of the court practice so far and effectively said that the uh, imposition of sanctions in itself limits uh, ability of sanctioned parties to, to have uh, access to justice and uh, fair hearing. Uh, and therefore, uh, the mere effect of sanctions should be sufficient for Russian courts to uh, apply pro these provisions of law. So this is, this is a, a, a rather su significant uh, uh, sort of de deterrent and uh, significant matter that uh, anyone doing business with Russia, with Russia should be aware of. And again, this is an indication of steps that uh, uh, the Russian government may take are uh, uh, in uh, developing some response uh, to sanctions. So I would uh, I would stop at that, and uh, I'd be very happy to answer any colleagues that you uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Konstantin. Uh, thank you again, uh, Nadia. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Peter. Um, I will close in in few seconds the the records uh, recording of the of the events, and then uh, I invite all of participants who will to wish to to give some questions and receive answers to reply. I would like just to uh, profit from this moment to uh, inform you that our annual uh, gala reception will be held in Moscow on uh, 10 March. Uh, unfortunately, again, this year we will be obliged to limit uh, the, the, the our audience by our uh, members and uh, close partners but anyway uh, we will uh, publish in few days our invitation i close then the recording stop